we continue to worship together, let's take our song books and turn to number 814, Wonderful Grace of Jesus. 814 as we stand together. Tonight, uh, Patch will be singing in the evening service and uh, performing there, so sailors need to be here back in the Fellowship Hall at 5.30 tonight uh, to go through uh, their practice there, one last one run through before uh, the service. It'll be 5.30 tonight, dressed, uh, dressed in, in uh, appropriate sailor attire there, so uh, make sure they're here at 5.30 this evening. And then tonight, after the evening service, there will be uh, teen uh, camp practice, so uh, teens need to bring uh, appropriate activity attire to change into after the service uh, for uh, teen camp practice. That'll be uh, for about how long do you know? Perhaps, Pastor Brantz, putting you on the spot. About an hour. About, or, yeah. about an hour or so. All right, very good. So just enough time to run the Dairy Queen or something. <laughs> 
unless you stick around here and talk, you can do that as well. So whatever, uh, whatever, enjoy the fellowship time. Next Sunday, we'll have uh, uh, Pastor uh, Herb Hutchinson uh, speaking for us all day, uh, Sunday school through the evening service. So teens and adults will be uh, combined for Sunday school here in the auditorium at 10 o'clock, and then he'll be preaching our morning service at 11, evening service next week at, at uh, 6 o'clock. So hope you'll uh, plan to be here for that. You'll know, enjoy uh, Brother uh, Hutchinson. And then I have three other announcements that are not in your bulletin. All right, first of all, uh, Dinah Young is uh, expecting her baby very soon, and uh, they use cloth diapers and can use some replacement inserts. So if you'd like to contribute to their diaper fund, uh, please give money to Alexis Hoddle, or if you'd like to get her something else, uh, she is registered at cottonbabies.com. That's cottonbabies.com. So if you want to help with that, uh, they don't use the disposable, so normally we would have, you know, diaper drop or something else appropriately pun uh, to mention there but uh, so she's uh, registered on cottonbabies.com or you can just give money to Alexis and we'll uh, make make a uh, uh, purchase there together also Sunday night uh, June the 6th after the evening service we're going to have a nursery workers meeting and we would also uh, ask that parents who are utilizing the nursery also be here for that meeting so that'll be uh, Sunday night, June the 6th. So that's two weeks from tonight. Uh, plan to be here for that. And uh, so we can shore some things up there in our nursery. Boy, it's good to see people back in church again. Good to have everyone here today. We're so glad you're, you're with us. Good to see some folk we haven't seen in a long while, as well as all of you we've been seeing plenty of. <laughs> so glad you're here. We'll have our ushers come. We'll receive our offering this morning. Everyone enjoying the cicadas so far? <laughs> Just wait a few days. We'll see if it's the same. Yeah, there you go. Ben, you want to ask the Lord's blessing on the offering, sir? Dear Lord, I thank you for this day today. I thank you for Sunday school this morning. I thank you that it was a blessing. I pray for uh, Pastor to give the words to speak this morning. I pray for this offering that would be a blessing to this church. In the name of Jesus, name. Amen. Amen.
as well. And they'll be back in our Sunday night services uh, beginning in the first Sunday there in June. So we appreciate uh, their ministry uh, to us, all who faithfully help us with our music, worship the Lord in, in song and instrumental. We're so grateful for that. Luke chapter 4 will be our text, and as my friend Will Rice would say, our authority today. Luke chapter 4. The Bible is our final authority. I hope it's your final authority. It's going to be one day. I hope it is today. Luke chapter 4 will be our text today. The title of today's message is Back to Nazareth. Back to Nazareth. The Bible, of course, is the word of God. It is the Holy Scriptures. And I want us to consider this morning this question. What I want you to consider this, this question. What position does the Bible hold in your life? What level of authority does the word of God hold, have in your life? When your preferences, what it is you desire, run contrary to the Word of God or in conflict with the Scriptures, who wins? Does the Word of God win or does your personal desire, your personal preference win? Is the Bible your final authority? When society is uh, pressuring you against the Word of God, what God's Word teaches that what we should believe and therefore how we should live when society is pressuring you against the word of God. Who wins? Is the Bible your final authority? When uh, scientific consensus goes against, is contrary to the word of God, who wins? Is it the science community? Is it the education community, or is it the Word of God, our final authority? The Bible is God's Word. It will be our final authority, and it should be your final authority today. Now, I know that most of us, when, you, when I pose a question, is God's Word true? Is the Word of God your final authority? We know the, the, the academic answer, we, and most of us would attest, well, sure, God's Word's your final authority. I, I mean, I'm not perfect, but God's Word is the final authority. But what I want us to consider this morning is what does that mean? How is that practiced in our life? Now, the Word of God is more than philosophical uh, appeasement or appealing to our intellectual capacities. The Word of God is where we find Christ and where we understand how to live this life for the Lord Jesus Christ. Nazareth, of course, was the hometown of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was there that he grew up as the carpenter's son. Uh, he had no doubt spent many a Sabbath day in this very synagogue that we're going to read about this morning. So the, the situation is this. The timeline, if you will, is that Christ has begun his earthly ministry and he's seen successes. He's, he's uh, had the interaction with Nicodemus in John chapter 3 and with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. He's uh, healed this, this uh, nobleman's son and later in John chapter 4 and he's continuing on his journey and now he's, he's back in Nazareth and we pick it up here. If you'll stand with me, we'll pick it up in verse 16. Christ is now back in Nazareth, this place where he grew up. He increased in wisdom, in stature, and in favor with God and man, the Bible says in Luke 2. And we see here in verse 16, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. There was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book. 
And he gave it again to the minister and sat down. And the eyes of them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? He was in Nazareth, remember? This is where he grew up. Is not this Joseph's son? How can he say such gracious words? Verse 23. He said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever ye have done in Capernaum, do also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, that's Elijah, and when heaven was shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout all the land, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elias, Elijah, Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, save, saving Naaman, the Syrian. And all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him under the brow of the hill, whereon their city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. But he, passing through the midst of them, went his way. Back to Nazareth. Father, help us, I pray, as we look into your word, as we glean some truths here from this portion of Scripture. Lord, I pray that your word would do its work to convince, convict, and change us according to your will. I pray we'd receive your word as it is everlasting truth work in our midst today again Lord and as always whenever we gather we desire that if there are any among us that don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior that they would realize their need for Christ and realize they can trust him today they can know that heaven is their home that they're part of your family in your safe capable hands but again meet with us we ask we pray these things in Jesus name and for his sake amen thank you for standing you can be seated I want us to notice, first of all, that the Lord Jesus was in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He was in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Jesus, of course, was a Jew. He was of the lineage of King David, again, fulfilling prophecy. And Jesus maintained many of the Jewish practices and customs uh, throughout his earthly life and ministry. Synagogues were places uh, for worship on Sabbath days. Uh, they were places for schooling during the week. So obviously when there were special times, the Jews would uh, travel to the temple in Jerusalem where, where, uh, for special feasts and, uh, and appointments and so on and so forth. But, but a system was set up for synagogues about oh, 500 years prior to this under the leadership of Ezra in that time frame and his contemporaries. Uh, where they would meet in synagogues for uh, when they weren't, they wouldn't go to the temple every every Sabbath, but they would meet in these synagogues where through the week there would be teaching and training, but on the Sabbath day, under the Jewish system, before the cross, God's people met on the Sabbath, which is Saturday. But after the cross, the new and living way was upon the first day of the week that they God's people were assembled. And the Bible clearly teaches that throughout the New Testament. We honor the Lord on Sunday, the first day of the week. That's why we've set aside this day as the primary day for our church gathering, that we would meet together to worship the Lord on the Lord's day. But Christ went to the synagogue. True followers of Christ today are faithful to the assembly, the local assembly of the local New Testament church. In Hebrews chapter 10 and verses 24 and 25. The Bible says, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. End quote. Now we're to gather together as God's people to encourage one another, to edify one another. We should be coming to church to be a blessing to someone else. If your main goal in coming to church is to get from the church, you're never going to. Amen. 
You see, the Christian life is a life of faith. You come to give to be a blessing and encouragement and help to someone else, and you'll discover something. It's, a, it's an act of faith that you would come to be a blessing when you're needy, but you'll discover that you are blessed when you come to be a blessing. It's the way the Christian life works. Uh, we honor the Lord, and we are, we are blessed. True followers of Christ are faithful to the church today, just like the Lord Jesus Christ was faithful with these Jewish practices uh, in his, his earthly uh, life and, and ministry. A typical Sabbath meeting would also would, would open with a reading that many of those that gathered would be able to quote. Now, I want us to look at that portion of Scripture. Keep your place here in Luke, if you would, and go back all the way back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. This, of course, is the Pentateuch, the, uh, referred to as the Law of Moses, or in the Law is often, often uh, referred to in the New Testament. Uh, the Law of Moses. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, and verses uh, 4, 4 through 9, uh, we see what was, off, was often recited at the beginning of this uh, Sabbath gathering. Notice what it says here, Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thine house, and on thy gates. They were serious about their relationship with God and the word of God, and they wanted it to consume their life. This, this, uh, this was not a religious practice where they'd go put their time in on the Sabbath and ignore God the rest of the week. Likewise for you and I. We're in the right place at the right time on the Lord's Day, on this Sunday, May the 23rd, I think it is, 2021. But we're to live the Christian life 24-7, 365. Not just 52 Sunday mornings a year. It should consume us. Our relationship with God, our understanding of the Word of God, we should live by the Word of God. So when the Lord Jesus Christ visited this synagogue on the Sabbath day, and this portion of Scripture would have been read, and then, then the common practice was that an a elder uh, in, the, in the community or a guest uh, who was, would, would speak uh, would be given the opportunity uh, to to uh, uh, preach or teach there in the synagogue and on this day it was Jesus who read taught and preached Christ was there they were there the question for you about this point this morning is this will you choose to faithfully assemble participate and edify the body of Christ the local New Testament church Christ was was in his place on this Sabbath day and you're in the right place this morning are you part actively participating in the work of the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ in a local New Testament church? If, you're, if you've been saved, if you know Christ is your personal Lord and Savior, you follow the Lord in believer's baptism by immersion, you need to be a member of a local New Testament church, faithfully assembling with that local body and giving and striving together for the faith of the gospel, going forward for Christ. Uh, the Word of God was not something that, that was, was just... a uh, visited on Sunday morning shouldn't be something that's just visited on some Sunday morning it should be something that consumes our lives just like the law told the Jews here that uh, the word of God needed to consume their life their the activity of their life in their home in their workplace wherever they would have been they needed to allow the word of God to reign to direct to be the authority in their life he was in the synagogue on the Sabbath I want us to consider secondly this morning that he read from Isaiah in the scriptures. And it's interesting here what Christ read. If you'll, if you'll go back to Luke chapter 4 and notice there in verse 18, the spirit of the Lord is upon me 
Because he hath anointed me, he's reading Isaiah, to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of the sight of the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, in our Luke chapter 4 and verse 19, what's, what's the next thing in your Bible after the acceptable year of the Lord? There's a period there. It's the end of Christ's statement, the end of his reading. Stop right there. Well, keep your place here in Luke 4 and go to Isaiah chapter 61. I want you to see something. Notice what it says here. In Isaiah 61, and we'll not reread verse 1. I've read that now twice to you. Uh, notice what it says in verse 2. I want us to see the point here. Isaiah 61 and verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Why did Christ stop mid-sentence in his reading of Isaiah chapter 61? Why was it that he stopped mid-sentence? He stopped right in the middle of that sentence. There's a comma here in, the, in, in Isaiah 61 uh, verse 2 in our Bible. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of the vengeance of our God to comfort all that mourn. Why did he stop mid-sentence? Well, we find that out back in our text. We see why. We see why he stopped mid-sentence. Uh, because this was a messianic portion of Scripture, referring to the Messiah. Who is the Messiah? Church? Christ. Christ is Jesus. Jesus is the Messiah. The one who was reading Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, was reading of himself. He was reading of, of that this portion of Scripture is being fulfilled in your ears. He was claiming to be, rightfully claiming who he was. He was Christ. He was the Messiah. He is Christ. He is the Messiah. The Jewish rabbis had rightly interpreted that passage there in Isaiah to be messianic, referring to the anointed one, the Messiah, to Christ, as many of our psalms do. Right This morning in the auditorium class, I taught from Psalm 22. It's a messianic psalm dealing with uh, prophetic of the, of the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And many of them... Uh, deal with with uh, the Messiah. Every word in God's word is important. Would we agree? Every word is important, right? Uh, the jot and tittle. Every, everything matters. The word of God, every word in the word of God is important. So when the Lord Jesus Christ, the word made flesh and dwelt among us, the word incarnate, stopped mid-sentence, it was for cause. There's a reason he didn't complete the sentence. What was, what was that reason? It is because the last half of the sentence was not yet, had not yet been fulfilled. The vengeance had not come yet. It was not time for the wrath of God and the judgment of God to come. No, Christ was come. The last half of the sentence was, was still, what, what had not yet been fulfilled. And let me tell you something, church, it has still not been fulfilled. The last half of that verse, I'll say half generously. I hope you'll allow me to use half. I know it's not quite half, but the last half of that verse was, has not been fulfilled. The last half of the sentence will surely one day be fulfilled. You say, how, how can you continue to hope that the last half of that sentence is going to be fulfilled? And you're one of these crazy preachers, one of these crazy people that actually believes the Bible? Yes, I am. I hope you are too. You say, you really think that God's going to rapture the church? Yes. I don't just think it, I believe it. You know why? It's in this book. I believe the word of God. You really think there's going to be a seven-year tribulation period? Yes, it's in this book. I believe the word of God. Do you really think that Christ is going to come again a second time and rule and reign and judge? Yes, it's in the word of God. I believe this book. Amen. You say, what difference does that make? It makes all the difference in the world. If you don't believe in the second coming of Christ, how can you trust Christ for your salvation? Well, it's how I feel. Well, how would you feel if I stomped on your foot? <laughs> don't live by your feelings, friend. And don't stomp on my foot either. We don't live by our feelings. We live by faith. Faith in what? The inerrant, everlasting truth, the word of God. It liveth and abideth forever. Christ read from the scriptures. 
Christ is going to come again. He's going to rapture the church. There will be a seven-year tribulation, and, this, and Christ will come again as, as judge uh, to rule and reign. He was in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He read from Isaiah in the scriptures. Notice with me thirdly this morning that he revealed the souls of those who heard. You know, the word of God, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, describes it as being quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit of the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. God's word's alive. When Christ read this portion of scripture to them, their first response was, oh, what gracious words. What gracious words. Is not this Joseph the, or, or Jesus the carpenter's son? What gracious words. Wow, he is so wise. Amazing words that he has spoken. But as Christ sat there, he began to teach and preach and expound the text, give them understanding of what the word of God meant. Christ who authenticated the word of God time and time again uh, throughout his uh, ministry over in Luke chapter 24. Let's go over there right, right quick if you would. Luke chapter 24. And notice what it says in verse 44. Luke chapter 24. In verse 44. I'm so thankful we have the word of God and we can trust it. Amen. Luke 24 and 44. We see Christ authenticating the Old Testament. Notice what it says here. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. You say, well, what does all that mean? What does all that matter? Those three divisions that are mentioned, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms, are the three common divisions of the Old Testament. The law of Moses, the Pentateuch, uh, the prophets, those prophetic books, and then the Psalms, those, that middle section there that we come to refer to as the middle of the Old Testament. He was authenticating the Old Testament. You say, well, what about the New Testament? We authenticated that as well. John chapter 14. If you want to flip over there, I'm going to read when I get there. John 14, 26, the Bible says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. How did the penners of the New Testament write what they wrote with the accuracy with which they wrote? The Holy Ghost gave them the words. He dictated the word of God to them. That's how, that's how they wrote with the accuracy with which they wrote. Uh, the word of God is in Aaron. Chapter uh, 16 of John and verse 23, the Bible says, and in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you whatsoever you shall ask. That's not the right verse. Hold on a minute. Whoops. That's right. Oh, there it is. Verse 13. I got 23. John 16, verse 13. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. Let me give you a great example of that, the book of the Revelation. God showed the apostle John things to come. The great tribulation, the second coming of Christ, uh, heaven. Uh, all these things that are to come, pro prophetic. How is that done? By God the Holy Spirit. He gave them the Word of God. Christ authenticated the Word of God, the Old and the New Testament. Christ is the Word made flesh and dwelt among us. What was he doing? He was preaching the written Word. Isn't that an amazing thing to consider? That Christ, who was the Word made flesh, often referred to the written Word that had already been given and received. He was Proclaiming he was preaching the word of God to be given. That's why we ought to preach and teach the word of God. You know, when I think I've heard every harebrained idea that could possibly be made uh, about some weird theory about the word of God, somebody comes up with something else. I, I scratched my head. I, I told my wife and daughters this week, I said, you know, there's so much of this book that we really don't understand yet. Why in the world people got to dream things up that have no basis? Look, look, if you just live the book, you know. You'd be a lot better off, and so would the society around you. Dreaming up crazy harebrained ideas. Look, read this book, study this book, live this book. 
This needs to be your final authority. This needs to be this needs to be the priority when your feelings contradict the book, follow the book. When the society around you is going against the book, live the book. When the science and the education system around you is going against the book, trust the book. Read, read this book. Let it be the final authority in your life. Christ was preaching and teaching the written word of God. The word, in God, word of God made flesh. The Lord Jesus Christ preached the written word. Christ authenticated the word of God. Christ pointed to the power of the written word. Christ pointed to the power of the written word to convict, to convince, and to change others. You remember the account there in Luke chapter 16 of rich, the rich man Lazarus? And the rich man pleaded that God would send someone from the dead to witness to his brothers. Do you remember what the response from heaven was? Verse 31, I think it is. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, what is that a reference to, church? The Bible. The Old Testament. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Christ has risen from the dead. Christ has risen from the dead. But if you don't believe the Bible, you're not going to be persuaded. Let the word of God be the final authority in your life. If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Christ was in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He read from Isaiah in the scriptures, and he revealed the souls of those who heard. You know, they first loved his graciously spoken words of wisdom. We see that in verse 22 and all Luke 4 22 and all bear him witness and wondered at the gracious word which proceeded out of his mouth wow this is an amazing this is uh, appealing to our mental our philosophical and political appetites wow this is amazing but you know what they wanted was a king to come and defeat their political enemy get rid of Rome this Roman oppression, let's run them off. If you're, if you're the Messiah, if you're the anointed one, set up your kingdom right now. Let's get this done. It wasn't that time yet. He paused in the middle of Isaiah 61 and verse 2. They first loved his graciously spoken words of wisdom, but when they were convicted of their personal and their national rejection, of the word of God, live their lives. The spoken word, the written word, was no longer a love that they expressed to his graciously spoken words, but they became full of rage. Full of rage. You see that in verse 28, that all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. They were angry. It was first well, but then it was wrath. Now let me just park here for a minute and give you a little bit of a background here as to why uh, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to dividing asunder of uh, soul and spirit of the joints and marrow and is discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So all these people are gathered in the synagogue on their Sabbath where they should have been. And Christ starts giving some illustrations. Well, you remember Elijah. You know, there were a whole lot of widows that were needy during Elijah's day, but where did he go? Where did he go? You notice what it says there in verse 25, or verse 26, but unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sarepta, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. You know what that was? You know what that location was? Jezebel's hometown. Do you think the people gathered in the synagogue in Nazareth on this Sabbath day knew what he was talking about? Listen, racism was a real problem in this time. We just preached through uh, John chapter 4. We understand this, right? Everybody with me? So when he brought up the fact that all these needy widows were going on, but, but, but Elijah went down there to Jezebel's hometown? I mean, she's the enemy of the state, isn't she? She's one of the, you know, Jezebel, would, uh, in our day, she'd been a terrorist. Jezebel and Ahab, not good people to Israel. Everybody with me? 
Not good. Not good. Then he, he went a little bit further. He says in 27, many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving name in the Syrian. You know, the word of God does its work to convict and convince us. The word of God will reveal your prejudices. God was preaching to them that, look, you're not going to get to heaven because you're a Jew. Everybody agree with me? There's only one way to heaven, for Jew or Gentile, and that is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what Jesus was proclaiming here is that he was the Savior for all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Christ is the Savior of all. You're not going to get to heaven because you're a Jew. You're not going to get to heaven because you're a Baptist. There's only one way of salvation, and that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and him alone. It was first wild, but then it was wrath. You know, most of us love the truth when it enlightens us. Oh, yeah. Ding. <clears throat> Light bulb comes on. That's wonderful. That's good. That's great. But we need to submit the truth when it accuses us. This book's a lie. Christ doesn't accuse us to damage us. Can I park here for a moment? This word is the everlasting truth. This Bible is the everlasting truth. God doesn't reveal his word to us. God doesn't enlighten us to the truth of this book to damage us. God enlightens us to the truth of this book so that we will make the change that needs to be made in our life so that he can build us. He can edify us. He can grow us. You say it this way. He can delight us. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This, this book is truth, and sometimes it smacks us in the face, doesn't it? But it's the truth. We need to trust, rely upon, rest in, live, obey the word of God, submit ourselves to it. What are you doing with the truth you know? What are you doing with the truth you know? When your preference or your desires conflict with the scripture, who wins? You or the Bible? When society is pressing you against the word of God, who wins? You Society or the Bible? When science, a scientific consensus is contrary to the word of God, who wins? Science or the Bible? So-called science or the Bible? Let the word of God rule and reign in your heart in your heart, and your life. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, Colossians chapter 3. What are you doing with the truth you know? You are all familiar with uh, the window of opportunity concept, aren't we? You're familiar with that, right? Um, any of you have an opportunity to buy one of these uh, uh, companies? You know, someone said, man, you may, maybe you, maybe 25 years ago, you, ought to, you, know, you might want to invest in Microsoft. And today you're going, boy, I wish I'd invested in Microsoft or Amazon or whatever it may be or Tesla. You know, those windows of opportunities, right? And you've got that window of opportunity to invest, and then there will come in the lifespan of a company, usually there comes a point where there's a window of opportunity to sell, right? We get that phrase, buy low and sell high, right? Window of opportunity. We want to, we want to be in that window to, to our best benefit, right? You know, when it comes to our lives, to the Word of God, the work of the Spirit of God, we have a window of opportunity to submit ourselves to the scriptures. We have a window of opportunity to receive the Savior. It's a window of opportunity. You say, preacher, I'm not following you here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to track with you, but I'm, I'm not getting this. Notice what it says again in verse 30 of our text. I want you to see this. Remember they gathered, let's go back to 29. And rose up and thrust him out of the city and led him into the brow of the hill where, where on the city was built that they might cast him down headlong. So they were gonna they were gonna have a lynching. They didn't like what he said. What he said was convicting them. They took him out to the edge of the hill. From what we understand, there was cliffs there around the city of Nad, or there are still today for that matter. And this would have been probably somewhere between 40 and 60 foot drop. That's a long way considered a five or six story tall building and they were going to cast him down headlong. They didn't like what he had to say. The truth, the truth was convicting and convincing them rather than yield to it. Nope, we're going to get rid of you. 
Verse 30, but he passing through the midst of them went his way. He came down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and taught them on the Sabbath days. And they were astonished at his doctrine, for his word was with power. So far as we know, Jesus never again returned to the city of Nazareth to this geography in his earthly ministry. I am in no way suggesting that no one in Nazareth ever got saved after this event, but I'm saying the window of opportunity for Christ's ministry closed after he returned here. Windows of opportunity. You know, some of us think because we're comfortable, may not have all the bills paid, but we know we're gonna be able to get them paid. We've got fair health, we've got this, we've got that. We're comfortable. I, I'll deal with God later. I'll get things right with God someday. I'll serve God someday later. Listen, the window of opportunity is now. When Christ convicts you, convinces you of truth, when the Word of God and the Spirit of God work in your heart and your life, look, that's your window of opportunity to respond to Christ. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day of salvation. Today's the day to get things right with God. I traveled with an evangelist for, for some years in my youth. And he often would, would uh, preach this, this phrase as evangelists, like all preachers, I guess, we all have our phrases we use. And, and he would often say this, why won't you get right with God? And he can preach it hard. Why won't you get right with God? Why won't you get right with God? Why won't you yield to the word of God? Why won't you get saved today? Oh, some other day. Don't be like that king there, the apostle Paul was trying to witness to. Come back in a more convenient time, a convenient season. I'll hear you again on this matter. We never hear that he ever did. Now's your window. Now's your window. What is it in this book? Let me just be, can I be frank and very direct? What is the Bible truth you know that you are disobeying today? Won't you get right with God? Your window of opportunity is now. Amen. If you're here today and you know the gospel of Jesus Christ, you know you're a sinner, you know that if you died today, you would be in hell. You know that Christ is the Savior. Listen, friend, we're not guaranteed tomorrow, let alone another breath. Today is the day of salvation. Come to Christ today. Come without delay. Today is the day. Today is the day. Trust him today without delay. Father, thank you for our time in your word today. This is a sobering account, a sobering event here. And Lord, I pray that you have worked in our midst today. There are those among us that have yet to receive you as their personal Lord and Savior, yet to repent of their sin and trust Christ for their salvation. Lord, I pray that they would come today. Their window of opportunity is now. I pray they'd come and be saved. Lord, if there are others among us today that you've convicted us of some areas of your word that we've not yielded to you in, perhaps it was something I preached this morning specifically, other things Holy Spirit, I trust you've worked in our midst, convicting and convincing of sin, righteousness, and judgment. But I pray we do business with you, that we would, we would get right with you. Or there really is no excuse not to. We must get right with you. I pray we would. I pray we take advantage of this opportunity to do so. Lord, I'm confident that there are others among us today who are burdened for loved ones, for friends, for acquaintances that we desire would come to you in faith, Lord, and perhaps we want to spend some time in prayer for them, that we'd be a better testimony and witness to them, that they would come to you very, very soon before their window of opportunity closes. I pray we do business with you now in this invitation time. We give the invitation to you, the service to you, guide and direct, we ask. We pray these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Let's keep heads bowed and eyes closed if you remain seated for just a moment.